Welcome to Innovation and Leadership. I'm Jess Larson. On this episode, we get to have Kyle Hansloven, CEO of Huntress. Kyle, thanks for doing this. Awesome, Jess. Thanks for having me, brother. So uh, tell people about the business. So elevator pitch would be really simple. We help the smallest businesses in the world. Think about those ones, you know, that aren't the Fortune 500. They're the, really the Fortune 500,000. Go toe-to-toe with hackers that are trying to go after their small and mid-sized businesses. Yeah. Um, so l- let's go back. Why don't you talk about your background and, and your, your time uh, with the government and uh, how that led into this? It's kind of funny how these like funny things tee up. Like I definitely didn't think when I joined the Air Force. I've always was a geek, always in cybersecurity, but it wasn't called that, you know, in the early 2000s. Cyber was something, you know, you kind of did dirty in a chat room. It wasn't this whole thing, multi-billion dollar market. Um, but I loved intelligence gathering and I got the opportunity to do that. So a couple of years in the service, I got to work with the intelligence community. And it wasn't just like, hey, let's look in, you know, look at gathered intelligence. It was like, hey, how can you use your offensive cyber skills to actually support one of two major missions. So the first one was counterterrorism. And if you think about that one, it's kind of brutal, right? You're gathering intel, and sometimes your target is, they call it kinetically uninstalled, right? That's a kind of brutal way to say it. But the other one is foreign intelligence, and that one was equally exciting too, you know, supporting kind of like all the intel gathering that helps our lawmakers, you know, really focus on national security. So kind of right place, right time in my career, and right time in the career field to kind of watch it go from intelligence gathering to infosec now to cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm interested, for so many of us where that can feel like such a black box, um, what, what does it really take to achieve mastery in that field? All right. So unfortunately, it's not like, you know, all the sexy Hollywood movies. Very little of it is instant gratification. And it really boils down to kind of the basics. And what I mean by basics are foundations. Most solid cybersecurity folks um, eventually get their hands dirty in computer science, learning how to program. There's plenty of other folks that might have started as a musician or something else. I've always been a nerd on this end. But when you learn some of that programming and you learn how to abuse things and really problem solve you're good at puzzle solving you can kind of think you know like a shady adversary you could think through how did somebody make a mistake what's going to cause them to open this email how can i make this software do something shady and then more importantly how can i exploit it take advantage of it so that mindset kind of gave me a leg up combine that with the computer science skills and they were a good combo yeah um when you think about the folks you know, whether it's at, at any of the intelligence community, uh, three letter agencies, soft community. Um, when you think about the folks who are just like kind of punching the clock versus the people that like get passionate and really go somewhere with it. Um, in your mind, those folks that, that really kind of become the superstars of that world, what kind of characteristics do you notice in common across them? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that too, because a lot of people... You know, if you think about how folks that market themselves, the soft community has a lot of stolen valor, you know, people that claim they were an operator, but they never saw anything. They never went through, you know, any sort of selection process. And cyber is a little bit of the same or especially intelligence community where folks are like, oh, I was at NSA. It's like, don't forget, NSA has janitors too, right? There's plenty of people cleaning the floors. Um, The folks that generally excel are oddballs. What I mean by that is, They've got a solid foundation in whatever their tradecraft is. If it's social engineering in the human intelligence side, on my side, obviously, it's cyber. Some people follow the money, but they usually combine that with ability to articulate messages clear and succinctly. And that's one of those things nobody warned me, like the first probably 15 years of my career. So even though I could crush it on some of the technical sides, I was not always the highest of flyer because I couldn't always articulate things. And I sometimes tick people off as a result. So I've been working on that, you know, the softer side of skills for the last kind of eight to 10 years now. Yeah, when did you get out? Uh, So I left active duty in 2010. And then I finally separated after I did probably another nine years in uh, the National Guard. So probably 2019, 2020, somewhere right around there, I got out for good. Yeah. Um, And then how did you start the business? Oh, man. So that's one of those of like, I was still in the National Guard, still serving, still doing my one week in a month, two weeks a year, uh, supporting offensive cyber operations. But 
you know, like most things, you start with an idea and you're like, ah, I could kind of do that. And because of that, like having access to that community, I had all these great ideas. Like I was slipping by, I was getting into these systems. And I started asking like, hmm, could I challenge like myself? Could, could me and my co-founders who are coworkers of mine at the agency, could, could we kind of catch ourselves better than other people? And you got to have a little bit of hubris to be a founder. And so thankfully, we had one of these opportunities to test it in the wild. Think about kind of like, uh, you know, Top Gun, the movie, they have all the simulated flights, you know, red on blue going head to head. Um, I got to do that for a long time in the cyber world. And one time I got to play instead of offense, defense. And it turned out our technology worked really well. And I think to be very frank, if it wasn't for that, like proof of value, there's no way I would have had the credibility to go out. I was not prepared to be a technical founder. That's for, <laughs> that's for the you know, honest truth. And um, you know, kind of like having that storytelling too, being able to say, oh, I've been in the service. I have deployed. I have done offensive missions. I'm also pretty good at defense too. And by the way, I can do this at a scale nobody else can do. That turned out to be a big differentiator. So I'm really thankful for kind of like the background that set me up for where I am today. Yeah, you know, it, it's, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts just about culture. Um, so when I was doing, back when I was doing leadership training, I had clients at INSCOM at Intelligence Security Command for the Army next to Fort Meade as clients. And then some of them ended up over at NSA. And um, I stayed in touch and stuff. I'm interested, um, when you think about, you know, Air Force, NSA, different, different places you work, uh, I'm interested in how you would think about their strengths when it comes to their approaches to cyber or, or this world? Ooh, I love this polarizing question because right now, like literally right now, you're having, uh, you know, House and Senate Congress argue about should cyber be its own force like Space Force? So I'll highlight the pros, the cons really quick, and I'll let you steer it wherever you want, Jess. Um, for us in the Air Force, when I first came in, my job was comms. 3CO was the, what we call AFSC. That's like the Army's MOS. And so they allowed us to train in to a job that later came about. And it was literally cyber warfare operator. That's my job. I'm not doing anything else. You know, I might rotate. Am I on the defensive side or offensive side? But I'm at least supporting the domain. So I think that's a huge strength that you can do that and it can be a career. Not all careers are equal. During my time, maybe the biggest joke we had is some of the sharpest folks I work with were Navy sailors. And some of these guys used to be like former nuke guys. So we're talking really, you know, smart brains. And then they would immediately go through the same training, support the mission like me. And it would be like the equivalent of sending a special operator, like, I don't know, back to turning wrenches or in some regular, you know, army unit, infantry or something. It just made no sense. And they would ship some of these guys out back to a boat. And so you could imagine the running joke was uh, the sailor to civilian program. So just calling a spade a spade, not all services, uh, you know, retain people equally. And maybe a good example, one of the most popular influencers in cybersecurity. I'm lucky enough. He works at my company. His name is John Hammond. He was in the Coast Guard Academy. They couldn't retain him at the end of the day. So John never even went through, went through the academy, just never went through service on that end. And that's a kind of as much as I could rag on one service or another, Army's done a really good job at retaining and giving career advancement options. Each service has kind of got their own level of pros and their own level of dysfunction. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm interested in the thought. So, um, you know, I was thinking about a clip where you were on the news the weekend of the big Casera hack. Oh, um, yeah. That was a nasty one. It was 4th of July. Yeah, yeah. So... I had Fred Vicola on the show and, you know, people don't know because is huge. I think they're $22 billion or something, right? So um, can you talk about that hack and why it was, uh, you know, why it was such a news item, why it was such a thing that got global attention? Yeah, let's, uh, let's try to get it spicy, but give some backdrop. Um, backdrop is, as I just mentioned, holiday weekend coming up. And unfortunately, cyber threat actors, you know, the shady criminals doing their thing. They love to take advantage of Western companies when they're going to be out of the office. Like I literally see it. We have 2.5 million computers we monitor right now. We see a huge uptick as soon as Friday at 5 p.m. happens. This is a real thing. So think about that in the backdrop. And what's happened is these threat actors um, discovered a vulnerability. It was a vulnerability some other Dutch re researchers have also discovered. And their whole thing was before this thing gets patched, before, you know, while it's still usable, 
let me not only get into one computer and do bad stuff, but if I can get into these systems, specifically the software we're talking about by Kaseya, I can not only maybe like take down the computers and steal all the data or encrypt all the data for one computer. This software is meant for managing hundreds of computers, thousands of computers. And so although I'm only aware of somewhere between, you know, 50 to 60 total of these, you know, systems that got compromised in the wild, um, by our count, it's roughly somewhere between, you know, 1,000 to 1,500 total companies. And we're talking about some of them being entire chains of grocery stores, uh, some of them being small community banks, others being things that are like, you know, actually handling more closer to like critical infrastructure, water, power, but not like the sexy big power companies. Think about rural municipalities. So when those hackers got in and they caused trouble, not only did they do it when everybody else wanted to be out on vacation, they started trying to ask for the world. They were asking for millions of dollars for the decryption keys. And it didn't pan out. Uh, most of those folks have ended up in jail now, but it was a big event. It was, uh, if not the biggest, maybe the second largest ransom incident that had happened. Yeah, amazing. Um, when you think about, well, tell us more about the business now, the two and a half million computers you, you monitor now. What services do you offer? Who's your ideal client? Yeah, yeah. So. My mom is my biggest fan. Like she's a small business owner. She's wild. Um, and she was really bummed. Like when I had left NSA, I had just won like the world series of hacking at Black Hat. And my mom was like, you're, you're going to support midsize and small. But like, why don't you go after the fortune 100? And I had to remind her like, mom, this is where the, like the backbone of economies, world economies are these midsize and small businesses. And they don't have someone like me. They'll never be able to afford someone like me. Um, and so our whole goal was like, how do I deliver my expertise for the price of a product? And that all comes from, by the way, that special operator world, the intelligence world. These teams are all about how do you take very small compartmented teams, have some sort of disproportionate advantage and deliver valuable outcomes. Like that is the recipe you could take and apply to kinetic warfare, psychological warfare, cyber, all of it plays the same playbook. And where I was going with that is, we figured out that like, oh, can I take my very small team of experts, put a ton of automation behind it and deliver like a $400,000 human for the price of like a $5 a month product. And that's really hard to do. And thankfully, like the service helped show me how to do that really efficient, but with intelligence gathering. So it was kind of a, a good tee up for big success, both for me and kind of those businesses. And so your, your average customer, how many employees, like what's kind of the range? Like, uh, probably above this, probably below that. What's, what's kind of a typical customer for you guys? Yeah. So first to describe the spectrum, we're talking about from like the five employee company to roughly the 5,000 employee company usually never goes above that. But what's wild is that's not where like the, you know, average is the average is closer to those like 40, 50, 100 employee companies. And what's wild about it is most of those companies don't even have an IT department or security yeah. people. They outsource it. So we actually have about 4,000 of these managed service providers. They manage all the IT for these midsize and small businesses. And that's who brings us to, I think we're up of over 110, 120,000 total companies now. Yeah. And so, uh, and specifically, what do these 120,000 clients get? These 120,000 yes. companies. Uh, ideally, the, the quick answer is peace of mind because most of them don't have security, but they can deploy a little tiny piece of software. Imagine you put it on your laptop, your servers, maybe if you got, you know, a workstation desktop and it just sits there. And its whole goal is not to just like have to manage something because we know these audience don't have, you know, cyber experience. They don't have somebody, even if you told them something bad was to happen, like, congrats, you gave me an alert. What do I do with it? So on our end, it's fully managed. So from the time of keeping hackers out, we're kind of like, just to get morbid for a second, you know, like healthcare, if somebody told you like, hey, Jess, you, you can't get cancer, you'd be like, that's crazy, right? We can't stop every incident. But when you do get sick, you want to find it when it's like stage zero, right? Rather than when it's terminal. So a lot of it is, oh crap, it's stage zero, it's stage one. Let's nip this in the bud before it actually gets out of hand. So it's a yeah. fully managed keeping hackers out. And we do that both for like the endpoints. And now you have to do it for the cloud because everybody's using an app, right? Everybody's using somewhere else to store their data. So as hackers change, we've had to change too. Yeah. So what, is that, what does that cost? Like what's, what's the range on the packages? 
oh man, just one flat fee. It's one of those things that like for the businesses, like we started looking in the enterprise and it turns out like most people don't realize you can be a big differentiator if you just keep things simple. Like if you have to give people extra knobs to turn, geeks like me love that. The local bank or the, you know, I think about the people who file my taxes, like they don't want to understand how the sausage is made in geek land. They want to file taxes and they want to file extensions. That's the only thing they want to do on April 15th. So for us, simple flat fee, a couple bucks they pay our service providers. Um, the bigger companies go direct to us. But the idea is through that couple of bucks, they don't have to hire a human. They don't have to worry about 24-7. They don't care how it gets done. They just get the peace of mind that, hey, ideally we stop it. And if we don't stop it, how do we prevent it from escalating? And sorry, that's... So that's a monthly per computer subscription yeah. or, what, or yeah, per it's a, a user model. subscription or what's the. Yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, for the actual computers, which is what we call our endpoint technology. It's priced on each one of those endpoints per month and it's recurring. So, uh, you know, these little things that if I could describe like a little bit to your audience, most people don't think of like, how do you tailor, right? An operation, right? How do you make sure you're actually making a big difference? And the first thing is knowing your audience. And so for me, turned out nobody wanted big contracts. They wanted to be able to pay on a month by month basis based on how much they actually consume. So we realized, okay, if it's, if you are protecting computers, let me charge you per computer. If you charge, if you're protecting like maybe online identities, you know, your Microsoft 365 account, we're going to charge you by Microsoft 365 account. And it just keeps things simple that way. That's something in the enterprise. They love that heavy contract stuff. In the real world that we operate with, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of businesses, they just, again, set it and forget it. That's what they really want. Yeah. When you think about how in the olden days, <laughs> in the olden days when you and I were starting our careers, um, it just was so implausible to gather huge numbers of small, medium sized businesses. And, uh, you know, about the time I was getting out of high school when the internet was a thing, all of a sudden, the world changed, right? And enterprise wasn't the only way to make a big paycheck. Obviously, Fred vicola has got Kaseya $22 billion, right? Um, when you think about advice for business owners today, fund managers listening today where they've got portfolio companies targeting small, medium, what's a, what's a marketing or sales um, insight that you would share just from your guys' experience? Yeah, so I've, I've raised well over 150 million in venture capital and convertible debt now. It's been all the minority side of venture capital. And the one thing I would share with you, Jess, is it was not easy to convince people in 2015 that there was an alternative model to the Fortune 500. So for the fund managers who haven't caught up yet, it turns out you can build you know, these not just two to $4 billion companies, but the true independent leaders who become 20 to $40 billion, you know, your 10 X market leaders. You can do it a couple ways. Of course, everybody knows you can build much bigger businesses. If you do B to C, like think of your, you know, my iPhone here, things like that. That's great. Um, you can sell apps. And obviously if you go to enterprise, those are big contracts, but if you can get really efficient, we're talking about low touch, high velocity, smooth everything out and find a good channel strategy. You can move product like, I mean, just on our end, people would not believe if I told them like now we're doing over a thousand new businesses per month, every month, like clockwork. But a lot of people slept on that go-to-market strategy. And that's what the team at Kaseya, the team at ConnectWise, there's a couple other vendors who figured this out. And the end result is you can build these like ours. You can build a true multi-billion dollar business on this end. Uh, and you could imagine the folks that skipped out on my earlier rounds think I've now returned like 130x multiple on those first rounds of investment. So, um, do, you, do you guys share publicly what your top valuation was? Uh, I don't think we do too much on top valuation, but like this year, we've crept over 70 million in recurring revenue. Next year, we'll definitely far exceed. We generally grow between 70 to 100 percent year over year. So, not like 10 percent or 20 percent. And so you could imagine back when valuations were really high, like uh, during 2020, 2021, those, those are silly valuations. Today, it sits right about that billion dollar valuation, which is a great place. It's a healthy place. The multiples are very competitive. Yeah. But really what's important, Jess, is it allows me to like, I'm sitting on 
eighty million dollars in cash and liquidity. Like I don't need capital. Usually people are trying to convince me you should take more. So it's a good position to be in right now. Yeah. Um. Well, let, let's talk more about this because, so I, you know, of nine hundred and something interviews, like I loved my interview with Fred. Uh, and one of the things I asked him is I said like, what's the difference between billion dollar company and multi billion? And he said that so often when he's advising CEOs, he says that they've got some product, some kind of product market fit. Like you never, you didn't get to hundred million without product market fit of some sort. Right. But he says, yep. you know, whether it's the hundred million dollar CEO or the billion dollar CEO, he talked about this concept. He calls it a revenue acquisition factory. He's like, you, you, you systemize the business. Like you didn't get to a hundred million without knowing what you're doing. Right. And, and having something that people wanted. He says what he sees so often is less maturity on a systematic, reliable way to bring in new businesses. And so with you, you know, how how, did you say a thousand a month or a thousand a week? Thousand a month right now that I'm bringing in minimum. So bringing in a thousand new businesses a month, right? That would suggest that you have figured out something about your own revenue acquisition factory. Uh, I'd love to talk more about how you, how you conceive of that. Yeah, I'd love to compare and contrast too. Um, If I would ask the average like Silicon Valley startup founder, who are the sexiest darlings of Silicon Valley? The same names come up, right? Slack, Uber, Airbnb, et cetera. And what's beautiful about those companies is they largely got to where they got through organic growth. There was definitely some inorganic purchasing other companies, but what has happened, and I'll I'll just uh, compare and contrast against Fred's real quick. At Kaseya, Kaseya started as a much smaller company. And what they did is they realized they had a pretty great go-to-market strategy that was greenfield. There wasn't a lot of people that even wanted to mess with small businesses. And they figured that out, that if they partnered with these managed service providers, they could move not just one product, they could cross-sell. So that, what he's describing is once you have that platform, whether you're the, the private equity folks tend to love to just buy another product and shove it down that pipeline. Let's shove it down the pipeline. And by the way, this can be an amazingly good thing for some of these customers that are underserved if they're getting good quality stuff served down to them. Yeah. I will say that you can also be really negligent here and send junk (laughs) down that pipeline. And if you've got a pushy enough, aggressive enough sales force, there's good and bad you can do with this good market strategy. Um, So Kaseya manages a combination between of organic what they're building and inorganic, what they buy and just push down this sure. uh, sales motion. So it's neat. If you bring and- that same exact model and say, hey, I've got the platform, but can skip the cost of acquisition of buying all these different businesses and innovate on your own, or like us, we've bought one or two companies already of ourselves, but at a much smaller level, we spend about 18 months converting them from what they are to what the SMB really wants. You no longer get some of this like middle level hyper growth. You get true hyper growth that looks a lot like the Ubers, the Airbnbs. So again, they're not different models. They're very comparable. But when you really look for the difference between like, you know, that phrase like shoot for the moon, even if you miss, you land among the stars, like you're not going to lose if you figure this out and can build a reputable. The question becomes is how big can you win and how much difference can you make? Yeah. So, so let's. Let, let's forget about Fred. Who cares about Fred? Let's just talk yeah, about you. Yeah. So um, when you think about um, your mental model and, and the way you conceive this, you know, 50, 100% per year growth, this, this um, bringing on a thousand customers a month, in your mind, you know, what were the ingredients and how did you bake that cake? Oh man, that's a good one. I, I'll tell you most of the time, I did not realize how big the bowl was or how big the appetite was. So even though I knew the ingredient was like, okay, end customers didn't have cyber talent. That's kind of really well established. There's only like a million articles written about that, but they also don't have budget either. And that's kind of opposing. You're like, wait, I got to give you something and even if I gave it to you for free, no one's available to use it. Like that's the type of problem mid size and small businesses have. And so I realized, okay, I'm going to have to build products completely different. Not like what the enterprise does, but do you know like that Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule? So we have to go in and say like, all right, I can't solve 100% of the cybersecurity problem. There's not enough budget. Nobody can do that. What 20% of extremely high value data 
will yield 80% of the value. And then if you think about that, that means that's less I have to compute because we're not talking about small amounts of data. Like when you and I kicked off this call, we both opened a browser. That browser is usually at least one process, right? That's what they call that. I deal with and like how many malicious processes per day. We're talking about 14 billion a day. I look at at my scale and we're just getting started. So when I say you have to figure out what small 20% yields 80% of the value, an example of what 20% looks like is I only look at 14 billion a day of these. So where I'm going with it is if you get really, really opinionated, you then have to say, okay, now that's less I have to store, less I have to compute, less a human has to analyze. And as a result, I can deliver the expertise of a human at the price of an affordable product. And what that does is it allows somebody else to now, instead of worrying about how do I hire talent or how do I retain talent, they can go take that budget that they're saving and with that unpredictability and just double down to what they do best. They invest in real estate, they can be, you know, double down on real estate, not having to worry about it. If they, again, maybe they do dry cleaning, they could just work on opening and where's the next place I open my dry cleaning store. So where I'm going with this is if you can figure out that niche and understand the problems that your core customer has, you're just in a completely different playing field if you can truly, again, zip your lips, listen to what they're saying, and then figure out a way to do that 10 times better, 10 times cheaper, or maybe 5x better and 5x cheaper is still 10x, you can really make a company a consequence. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so I, uh, you know, I'm sure my audience is sick of hearing this, but like I'm a real audiobook nerd, okay? So if you don't count like, you know, 400 books in the Jason Bourne genre of fiction, Take just the nonfiction, you know, business, investing, marketing, sales, philosophy stuff for, for work. It, it's like a thousand-ish books I've listened to on Audible that way. And nice. for sure, in my top three is The 80-20 Principle by Richard Koch. And, nice. Uh, so I was one. like such a fanboy when I got to have him on the podcast. And for people who don't know, so he's at, at Boston Consulting Group, went to Bain, then he started EKR. I think he sold the shares for, I want to say, five million bucks. And using the 80-20 principle, he, uh, he invests in these star businesses and he turned 5 million bucks into 1.4 billion working like an hour a day. And uh, so I'm like such a fan. 80-20 principle really can make a huge difference. And if where I'm going to double click on that is if you just listen, where most, I'm telling you, most entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs want to tell the customer the problem. And if you can't get past that, if you can't just honestly listen to the pain point you'll never be able to figure out what is that 80-20 ratio, and it exists. I've seen it. I've seen it in crazy things that aren't tech. And if you think about that, going back to the companies I mentioned earlier, Uber, taxis already existed. The 80-20 was people forgot the pain point of hailing some shady ride and calling a number and having someone not show up and not have a rating. That was nasty. So they simplified it and delivered, again, 80% of that value not necessarily 20% of the cost, but 20% of the effort. And that's why I can continue to use write apps. Yeah. Um, I'm interested where else you feel like the 80-20 has shown up in your business. Or like the 80-20 of the 80-20 of the 80-20, that like 1%, but, but, you know. So um, I'm, I'm a book fan. I don't do nearly as much on audiobook. And it turns out some books are really bad on audiobook. Like, uh, you know, for the, the visual uh, folks that are watching this sucker, I'm holding uh, Eli Gill's High Growth Handbook. This is not a book you ebook. It's not a great read. It's an amazing handbook. Um, but my point is, if, like, when you pick up some of these things, my favorite being good strategy, bad strategy that I got here. And you could see, like, I'm knee deep. I write in this sucker. Where I'm going with this, uh, talking about these books, is when you get down to the 80-20, and I think about that high growth handbook, and you really get down to the, you know, the very small 1%, nobody will tell you certain things like, guess what? When you're moving so fast as a hyper growth company, if you happen to be that 1%, you are literally a different company every 6 to 12 months. And that means you're top performing. Think of like the rock star at your company who is ahead of the pace of this, I don't know, call it a race car, right? This race car is going, but they're able to outpace it. At hypergrowth, your best person six months later is now only as fast as the race car. And you give them another six to 12 months later, your top talent, your 1% talent is largely behind the race car. 
And what I mean by that is you could be turning over your best talent every six to 12 months. It is something that is not for the faint of heart. Nobody warned me about it. I'm very lucky and privileged to be like in this hyper growth problem, but that was just something I personally uh, wish I could have like learned much earlier because it was kind of hard. Like I'm thinking, why is everybody falling short? And it turned out like even me, like I fall behind and I have to level myself up or I get fired, right? I will get fired from my own baby. And that's one of those like savage comments, but it's really, you know, that's how it works. Well, I'm, I'm super fascinated in that. Um, I think about like, it's funny, you know, earlier on, I had a lot more investor, you know, a lot more guests, you know, CEOs in the tens of millions, right? And then started having a lot more in the hundreds of millions or hundred-ish million. And then nowadays, you know, we still have some of those, but we have, you know, we, we try to spend a lot more time with the folks who've got kind of the billion plus or 10 billion yep. plus. And um, I, like, I could not agree with you more, not from experience, but just by hearing the stories. Like I take the hundred million dollar entrepreneur and the billion dollar plus entrepreneur. And like, I consistently hear more about um, listening, like a different kind of listening, like a humble listening of like looking for disconfirming evidence where it's almost like mm. the smaller, the smaller, the entrepreneur, the more they're listening to prove themselves right. Uh, if they're listening and like the further ahead they are, like um, Steve Blank from, uh, you know, Stanford sold his last company yeah, for 8 yeah, billion. Yeah, I know exactly who you're talking about. Lean, you know, lean startups wrote about him. Um, you know, he, he is like, he's one of my favorites because he, he's like obsessive with the customer listening, right? But he's like, he's a perfect example of these guys who are like, okay, I'm, I'm trying to invent the puzzle piece that fits exactly in the puzzle piece size hole in their life, right? And he's constantly it feels like he's constantly looking for the friction and he's like, he's like, he is so destination to like, he's completely married to the destination. We are going to get to, we are going to get to this. We are just like extreme customer love. They're pulling this into their life kind of thing. Right. But like super vehicle agnostic, like super willing to throw out his own ideas based on, cause the customer said this. And uh, it's, it's kind of a funny juxtaposition of like e extreme rigidity on, on destination, extreme flexibility on, on vehicle. And th this like, I don't know how to describe it because it's like billion dollar founder after billion dollar founder. It is listening, listening for what's wrong with us instead of what's right with us. Uh, observing. Can I tell you what we call it internally? Yeah, yeah, like please, this please. is a phrase we use, but describe it exactly. We call it passionate opinions loosely held, meaning okay. like I'm going to come in there with all the data I think I've designed, I've listened, but I'm going to listen and force myself to find that level of friction so I can prove myself wrong and loosely hold that opinion that is still passionate. But if you cannot get to that loosely held piece, you will not go from like, there's just it's fairly easy. That's wrong. It is really hard to get to a hundred million dollar business. But when you're at a billion and start hitting multiple billions, you have to be okay with just soul searching for like what's wrong. Because when I make one of these bets, think about that. I have a hundred thousand plus companies. If I'm going to build a new product, even if I, if I don't get this right, I'm disappointing a hundred thousand plus businesses. But if I nail it, I'm now going to go from 100,000 plus that were already raving, you know, fans to now 100,000 plus super fans. And I could potentially double plus my revenue on that end from one product by, again, cross selling, upselling. And so if you get that right, you can imagine you can make a huge difference to the world like we're doing on cybersecurity. And if you get it wrong, you can make your company implode. So I honestly think it kind of weeds people out for you because if your passionate opinions tightly held, no one's going to buy your, your product and you're just going to find out the hard way through acquisition that you got it wrong. So yeah. I love that you called this out. Well, okay. I'm going to add my other two elements to it and I want you to disagree with me if you disagree. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But I feel like it's like very humble listening for disconfirming evidence, um, observing on what people aren't saying. Like there's a lot of like, Hey, this is what the customer said, but here's what they actually did. I like data, the many, like physically observing them, like all sorts of like 
sometimes the customer doesn't know what they're doing. Sometimes they don't know what they want kind of thing. And then this like, you talked about soul searching. Like this is some, this is like a common thing I hear through these hundreds of interviews, right? Is this like, and then I went off and thought really, really hard. And then I thought hard longer. And then I thought hard longer. And I realized the dots that people weren't putting together, you know, because I actually heard something that I hadn't heard before and I've seen something I hadn't seen before. And it's like, they're connecting dots that other people hadn't connect. And it's, I, I don't know if you like, I kind of feel like this is a trifecta, but I, I'm, I'm going I'm to I'm try so to get to the see second one that you said. Um, you talked about the humility, but you also talked about like having to be able to see through, like I'm thinking about that, um, you know, Henry Ford comment of faster horse, right? Um, we have a phrase and I, I don't think I'm going to be able to match one for the third one, but for this one, we use the word appro- approachable bad. And what it means is like, you have to be good enough to imagine they need the car, not just the horse. So you have to be that awesome top talent that has this vision. But if you come in with, without humility, you come in with ego, you come in with pompousness, you are going to get shut down. You're not even going to get that. So that for us, that, that approachable bad nature is not only like a major part of our brand, we actually contribute that to a huge part of our success of getting people to drop their guard and actually tell you their embarrassing problems. Because remember, people don't just like moan and complain. Their real problems are usually embarrassing. They're usually something that they feel humiliated by. So if you don't have it, so I'm for, you know, if you can't tell, I'm agreeing. I was able to find two parts within my own company culture that relate to what you're talking about. That could be accident. Obviously, you and I didn't pregame on this stuff. And then that last one you mentioned, right, of just like, I can't take this co- comment. It was actually Joel Delgalarza, uh, who's a managing partner at Andreessen Horowitz. He told me every good um, you know, company's core values essentially bo- boil down to don't be a jerk. We before me. And the last one was running through walls. That piece you described about obsessing. And I went back and thought, and then I thought through some more. Like if you don't have both as a founder entrepreneur in you, the desire to want to not, and notice I didn't say open the door or push through the door. I'm talking about like, imagine the visual right now, Jess and I are, you know, standing up from our desks, running into a wall. And if you're not ready to just run into it till you eventually run through it, you're not going to make it. Whether you want to run for Congress, whether you want to be a commander of, you know, some military unit, or you want to go and be a startup entrepreneur and build a big business you better have that passion to run through walls because if not, it will, it will humiliate you, right? It, it'll, it'll prove you why 99% of companies don't make it. Yeah, I would actually love to talk about that. So funny enough about you bringing up the 80-20 principle before I could, um, I literally like my internal monologue for like those three things, I call the third one 80-20 thinking. Like this like deep, obsessive, you know, sh- put the phone on airplane mode, Go somewhere where like your family or employees can't interrupt you. Like it's like, like going to like monk mode and it's like obsessiveness about where's the hinge point? What is the small thing that will make the big difference? And right. uh, I, I didn't pull that away when you said it earlier. I'm now, now that you said it, I immediately, you know, that scene in like, uh, you know, the Jurassic Park where the Raptors are testing all the different weak spots. Like you have to not only run through walls, but you can't run through a brick wall. Like that's not possible. You have to go and say, oh. I have to find the weak part. Let's find where the joints are. Let's find where there was some damage. Maybe there was some water, something along those lines. Can't just be willing to, you know, all the energy in the world won't help you do something impossible. So you're right. There is a dynamic there of you have to have maybe this, maybe take it the other way, 80, 20, 80% of passion in you, but there has to be 20% of some magic. And to be honest, when it works, that has to deliver 80% of the value if you don't work. So there's something to what you're saying that I did not pick up on in the beginning, but wholeheartedly agree with you. <laughs> um, so I, I want to, I, I think about so many of the principles that either from the books or from the guests off the show or, you know, my own entrepreneurial business. Uh, I think one of my favorite analogies is the balance beam, like mm-hmm. underdo it, fall off this side, overdo it, fall off this side, you know, <laughs> like Goldilocks, just right is down the middle. So I want to talk about, uh, humility and being willing to smash into the wall 10 times till you break through or 110 times or 1,010 times. So specifically, if you are talking to founders 
who are trying to invent their whole new category. Or, you know, what they're doing is so different, it could basically be its own category. And like you said, the, the venture capitalists or their mom or whoever is like, uh, I don't get it. That's not how it's done. And you're like, yeah, I know. I'm like telling you how it's going to be done. And they're like, sounds risky. I'm not sure it's going to pan out like that, right? When you think about this, like, I guess my question for you is, so in our real estate fund, we're really, we're going to build these small resorts for action sports families by national parks and surfing beaches and wake surfing, like snowboarding mountains, stuff, I guess. Because for us, it's like, like when you go to these places, there's no place to wash your bike. There's no place to wax your snowboard. Like they're not built for us. Right. And they're just boring. They're kind of, you know, the Marriott's kind of expensive and it's just a, it's just a box with an extra bathroom. You know, it's, it's pretty boring. So I keep thinking like, I don't want to be like a me too of another Airbnb. Like we are drowning in Airbnbs at this point, right? Like the, the word is yeah. out, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and so like my favorite inspiration is like hearing like, and this is like not very humble of me, but like all the w Walt Disney stories about how people thought he was mental with Disneyland. And like the Disney corporation almost and, and didn't he own might Disneyland. Have. <laughs> right? Yeah. He might yeah. Have. Yeah. But, um, but like he, like, Theme parks and carnivals existed before Walt Disney, but he did it on like a different scale and a different level. It, it kind of invented its own category. You know, like nobody, nobody's like, is like, thinks about like their state fair and Disneyland in the same sense, like as those are fungible opportunities, right? So I look at this idea of like, we actually want to build like Disneyland in the woods for action sports family, less than 20 minutes from that place you know less than 20 minutes from the grand canyon where five million people were going anyways right and my question is like <clears throat> when to listen and when not to listen right yeah like like the so, henry ford thing of the my customers would have said they wanted faster horses you don't listen and then there are plenty of times that like my ego or my thinking i'm better has got me in trouble and so i'm this is a very long lead-in question to <clears throat> you you're not trying to get the giant enterprise accounts and, and you built the billion dollar company that you said you, did, you would when a lot of people didn't think it was possible. So guidance for founders who they want to do something genuinely original and they're not always sure when they should be listening and when they should be trusting themselves and, and any guidance on that decision tree. I'm going to try to tie all these together. The balance beam is a great analogy, right? Lean too far one way, too far another, you fall off. But ultimately, your, your goal is to stay somewhere in the middle. I think what we're describing is not just how do we stay in the middle, but remember, you got to traverse the balance beam, right? And you've also got to dismount it and land. So I always try to think in these things, like there is nothing harder than inventing a new category because no one believes you. I didn't actually try to invent a new category. And I found myself like, I want to say maybe a hundred different term sheets I never received, right? I got verbals. I had, hey, I like this. Some were polite. Some thankfully were just told me I was wrong. But I'm telling you, I got turned down a lot is the point I'm trying to make. And I was not trying to lean too far to the left or too far to the right. I was just trying to go down the balance beam in a different way, maybe walking on my hands. And so where I'm going to do to tie all this together is I think it's important that if you are going to do something different, consider just how different. Like, for instance, let's use the Disney World example. There were already carnivals. We already knew people wanted to pay both for destination traveling. Hawaii, right, was a thing well in the 50s, about the same time this was going on. There's been all kinds of other travel. Carnivals traveled into town and then left because they knew people only wanted a little bit of consumption and then they would grow tired. And so he didn't invent travel and he didn't invent, you know, fun rides and storytelling and everything else. He invented combining the two together. So I think the magic there is making sure you don't over rotate beyond. Like for the average layman, they probably aren't comfortable outside of the 80%. So when you're pitching, you sometimes have to think about how far you can travel down that balance beam. I had to show a little growth and say, look, this balance beam might be 10 meters long. I'm going to go three meters and it's going to look like this. And I got them comfortable. They could see 80% of my vision. And then I had 20% deviation that they were willing to like, yeah, say, 
He might fall off, but I believe it. I think your idea, there is already plenty of examples of people travel to austere locations for these. And there are plenty of examples if you go to either an Airbnb or online review sites that say, uh, I think the last time I went to Lake Havasu, right? Uh, that's Arizona for those that aren't aware. Beautiful lake, everything else. People love to ride the dunes, everything out there. Couldn't find a place to rent my boat. Didn't have shower facilities for this. Couldn't park my ATV or side by side. There's endless of those. So to me, your idea sounds a whole lot like, hey, you've got two different things that are very clear. There's data points. People are already doing extreme sports. They're already traveling to destinations. Probably, just like me on my end, I had to change some of my vision. And it penalized me. I will say some people in the beginning just couldn't see it. But by the time I had $5 million in revenue, and then I said, hey, look, next year, I'm going to go from 5 to 10 during the middle of COVID, and then dunked it, and then went from 10 to 20, and then 20 to 40, they were like, okay, this guy's got his stuff. And so you and any other entrepreneur, I would just make sure you have to pitch a grand vision, but you have to make sure it's achievable first. So for me, that balance beam is a perfect analogy that you started with. And again, you still got to tell them like each step of the way, if I make it two meters, I still have a clean dismount. If I make it five meters, it's a better dismount. And if I make it all the way to the end, I'm going to backflip off that sucker. We're going to land, stick it 10 out of 10. And that's one of those things that I think that overcomes people's comfort zones. I would just make sure, notice I didn't say, go with something with 20% of proof point and uh, run with 80% crazy vision. Because to be very frank, that could work. It's just going to be very hard convincing people to go with you. Um, I appreciate that advice. I, I was kind of, you know, obsessing about this at lunch today and thinking, <clears throat> you know, we envision ourselves more of an entertainment company that happens to, you happen to be able to sleep at, right? Like life-size Jenga sets. We were doing like twin zip lines around the full 40 acres. So you can race your kid for the, you know, like, Big bike jumps, like we're probably going to make people sign waivers like they're going to a ski hill or a, or a skydiving place. Like, you know, what I mean? like this is not helicopter awesome. parent padded everything. Like this is, this is what we wanted when we were 15, you know? Um, but, uh, you know, I, I appreciate this idea of like, give them the three, murder, three meter version. Like, because they're all going to get Airbnbs. They're all going to get rentals near, you know, near Yellowstone, national parks, ski hills, right? Like. And, and maybe boil the frog slowly. You know, yeah, I mean, boiling the frog slowly, but you, I mean, you and I are in fortunate positions. We have access to capital, things like that. We could take bigger bets, but for the bootstrappers out there, the real like crazy hungry ones that didn't come from, and I grew up broke, properly broke. There's a reason I enlisted at 17. Um, you can't take the same gamble. So sometimes you just can't even, even if you could pitch to go the full 10 meters, Doing a three meter pitch, sometimes the answer is like, hey, they're already there staying in Airbnbs. So I'm going to create in the middle facilities for them to wash, store, whatever. And then often you can bootstrap yourself to the point that it's eventually a destination result. Again, it's not the fastest way to go there, but it might be the secret to going the furthest, right? I think about that African proverb if you want to go, you know, uh, fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Sometimes you got to start you know, on a lonely part of your vision by yourself where it doesn't make sense. Why is this crazy founder offering wash facilities and storage facilities for an ATV and some off-road bike ramps at this place everybody travels to when the real goal from the beginning was I'm going to have 200 rooms and an experience unlike anybody else and I will be a destination. So I encourage it just as long as you don't over-rotate and think I'm going to build 80, uh, you know, rooms out in the middle of nowhere first. That's crazy. That's the wrong version of it. Don't do that. <laughs> That's great advice. Well, listen, um, if people listening are like, oh, yeah, we probably, we probably need their services. Um, do they go direct to you? Do they go to a reseller? How does that work? Yeah, what's awesome is they can hit the Huntress team. And for us, we do. And this was a hard lesson learned. We do what's called channel first, meaning like when someone comes to us, we ask, who do you want to get fulfilled through? Do you already have a relationship? You don't have one? Let us recommend one. And when somebody says, hey, Kyle, uh, I don't want to, I want to go direct, of course, we'll take them direct. But for us, that makes sure we take care of our partners. It's a key part of our go-to-market strategy. We are truly a partnership on that end. And it works both ways. So yeah, they can just hit us up at Huntress.com. Okay, great. Listen, this has been so fun for me. Hopefully somebody else liked it too. This has been great for me. Um, 
What do you want to leave people with today? Yeah, I think uh, you know, there's probably some uplifting, right? You could leave it with all kinds of negatives. I will tell you that maybe the best thing that I would recommend to any entrepreneur is when you are your biggest critic, nobody else's voice will pull you down. I'm not saying go hyper you know, negative on yourself and get yourself into a depression, but developing that eye that scrutinizes your ideas, I would say leaves you with the situation that you got to be a little crazy to be a founder. And I will think of my, one of the moments from uh, Guy Kawasaki's Art of the Start book. He describes a moment where if you can crit- criticize yourself and be your own worst critic, you know, Jess, you and I, we can go dance in a field together and everybody else will look at us and say you're crazy. But what happens is slowly three, four, five people join the company. You get some customers. Now it looks like five people dancing in a field. That's still kind of crazy. But by the time you're, you know, 20, 30 people, you look like a party. And if I could give any entrepreneur, right, you coming in, making sure, you know, self-criticizing yourself and having that faith, you know, you still have to objectively criticize yourself but it'll get you through the hard times and there will be hard times. Even at our point, you know, billion dollar plus valuation, I have hard times at least once a month. So I, you know, I'd say keep up the faith, believe in yourself and you'll figure it out. I love it. Well, I appreciate you making so much time for this. This has been great. No, likewise, this is awesome. And thank you for having me. You bet. Bye everyone.